Chronicles chapter 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, um, there's a one in the pew in front of you. The reason I like people to look on Bibles, at the Bible, is so they can know what I'm saying is coming from this book. Because if what I'm saying is not aligning with the book, uh, you, you, we've got a problem here. Before I do that, uh, there's a letter from um, the, the Brown family, dear church family. We'd like to thank you for all the generous gifts you have given, Brian. Thank you so so very much for all the prayers that have been and are given on our behalf. They are much appreciated and needed. We are truly blessed to have you all as our church family. We would also like to thank those that came and did some work around the house. You all did a great job. We can never thank each one of you enough for the blessing that you are. Love in Christ, Brian and Valerie Brown. Just uh, uh, They've gone through an awful lot with cancer, and we praise the Lord uh, that we could be a blessing, and so many of you were. Second Chronicles chapter 12. Let's all stand if you're physically able as we observe the reading of the word of God. Second Chronicles chapter 12. We come to a, a story before we dive in. Let's understand the context of the story. So we found De Saul was the first king. God didn't want Saul. The people chose Saul and that turned out badly. David would come on the scene and then we had Saul on the scene and for about 80 years, give or take a little bit, they have been building this kingdom and this wealth and have amassed multiple millions and millions of dollars. And then Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, makes some mistakes. And then Jeroboam, they, they split. Jeroboam goes to the north, takes 10 of the 12 tribes with him in rebellion to Rehoboam. And then Rehoboam stays in the southern kingdom and uh, he will set up his kingdom. And we're going to talk about Rehoboam. But Jeroboam, you remember throughout all of the Chronicles and Kings, you remember what is always said of the northern kingdom? Don't be like Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. This guy started to do all these bad things. There was never a good king in the northern, northern province, northern kingdom of Israel. But we find Rehoboam. Let's dive into our story and try to understand what God is saying today. 2 Chronicles chapter 12, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had what? Strengthened who? Okay, so basically for three years, he had everything going. Things were going well. Notice what the Bible says. He what? Forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. God, he allowed God to be a part while things were going well. But when he was good, he said, God, no thanks. Notice what the Bible says. God does. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord with 1,200 chariots and threescore thousand horsemen and the people that were without number that came with them. And he lists some groups that came. Jump down to verse 5. Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak. And said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Look at verse 6, and this will be our text. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king did what? They humbled themselves and they said, The Lord is righteous. In other words, what they were saying was, the Lord is right. His way is right. His will is right. And I just need to align myself with him. Let's have a word of prayer and jump in this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for heaven. Thank you for your word. God, as we jump in today. Would it be crystal clear what you are trying to say to us? Lord, I pray opinions would be left out of it. Our personal thoughts would be left out of it. We would jump directly to your word and find out what you are trying to say. Lord, we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I grab my lapel microphone. It's been a crazy week. I've shared this with several, but uh, something brand new happened to me this week. Um, I got a call to do a funeral at 1240 on Thursday afternoon. Pick up the phone and they said, Pastor Lang, are you available to do a funeral? And I said, you know, I always try to say yes. I always want to get the gospel to as many people as I can. And so I said, yeah, when's the funeral? We'll see if we can work it out. They said 20 minutes. <laughs> that was a new one for me. 
And I said, well, you know, um, I can't get there in 20 minutes. I probably wouldn't even be able to get there until at least 1.30. Because it's way up farther past the north side of, uh, it's on three past, past the north side of, uh, of Muncie up there. And I said, I don't even think I can get there in that time. And they said, hold on a minute. So they put the phone down. They go talk to the family. They come back. The family says they'll wait. Okay. I'll come. I'll come. I'll work it out. I moved some things around really quick. Um, I didn't have, you know, I always do a funeral in a suit and tie and uh, I you know I was I was doing some work around the church before so I wasn't even dressed in that so I had my wife ironing a shirt and I'm trying to find stuff and we get ready and we get out there and you know I'm thinking it's gonna be a smaller funeral you know if everybody's waiting for me I come in and the way I came in was right in front of everyone all eyes looked at me as I walked in as if to say everything was going according to plan but the silly preacher can't show up on time that's how it felt. And so very quickly, I had a very brief discussion about uh, the deceased. And uh, I, I never met the person. And so we learned a little bit. And we went through and we did. And my goodness, that was all brand new to me. But praise the Lord. Um, just, uh, I, you know, I love trying to be an encouragement and a blessing. And um, love giving the gospel and to telling people about Jesus. So what a week it's been. Second Chronicles chapter 12, we find our story. Who is always right? Who is always right? And the answer should be, God is always, always, always right. Has God done ever done anything wrong? No. Has God ever made a mistake? No. Now that's easy to say in a church setting, but sometimes when we're in private and something happens that we don't like, who do we want to blame? Right? Let's just be honest. Let's not try to act all pious because all of us have been there when something didn't go right and something happened. We're like, God, you could have, but you didn't. So the question today is, do we believe that God is always right? We find our story here, and uh, you can teach the Bible and read the Bible in different ways. You can do a topical study. You can study a word of the Bible. You can find that word all throughout Scripture. You can do a word study. And I think it's good to study the word grace, study the word mercy, do that. You can read topically. You can read on, on, a, on a topic. You can do uh, expository. That's normally how we preach, especially Sunday night. And Wednesday night, we take a book of the Bible. We go verse by verse, and we just dive in together. This morning, we're going to do more of a character study of this man by the name of Rehoboam. Rehoboam. Uh, when, when we come to a tough time in the life of Israel. Israel was new. They were just getting started. God had delivered Moses and the children of Israel from Egypt. God brought them out of bondage. By the way, Egypt in the Bible is a picture of sin and our salvation. When we get saved, we are delivered from bondage. And of course, you know the story. The children of Israel will come and they'll get to the Red Sea and God will part the Red Sea. They'll get to the other side and you know that chapter in Exodus, they sing God's praise. Oh, God, you're wonderful. God, you're great. God, you delivered us. God, you're all of this. And then they go a little farther. And what do they do? Complain, whine, upset at God. Isn't that how our, our lives are? Especially for the saved individual. We get saved. Then we go a little farther and God does something great. Then we go a little farther and things aren't going the way we want. So what do we do? We complain. Don't, don't get too mad at Israel, because you and I kind of do the same thing, right? So now we see Israel has come, and then we see the story of the judges. God brings judges in, the book of Judges. God in, in, uh, allows and uses different men and gifts them in certain way, like Gideon defeats the enemy of Israel. Samson uh, eventually would sort of defeat the enemies of Israel. We see different judges. And then what does Israel want? We want to be like everybody else. Everyone else has a king. God, give us a king. God said, if I give you a king, he's going to take all of your children to serve in an army. He's going to make you pay taxes. He's going to do all these things. You're not going to like it. And Israel says, we want to be like everybody else. God, we don't care. We'll do it our way. So who do they pick? They pick Saul. The Bible says Saul is head and shoulders above everybody else. He's stout. He's strong. He, and uh, humanly speaking, he was the best candidate to be king. What happens? Saul was not God's candidate to be king. 
So what happens? Eventually Saul would cause all the problems and cause a lot of issues. So God raises up a king named David. David wasn't perfect, but man, God used David in a great way. And God talks very highly of David. David wrote many of the Psalms. We see David's humility even after he sins. We see a lot of things from David. And then David sets it up for God to build the temple under Solomon, his son. So David gets all this money, all this timber, all this gold, millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff to build this temple, the central focus of worship to God. And then Solomon, of course, you know the story. Solomon wasn't all he should have been. But Solomon left the kingdom in a pretty good condition. Rehoboam comes on the scene and people come up to Rehoboam and they tell Rehoboam, hey, Rehoboam, why don't you make it a little lighter on your subjects? Don't be too hard on them. Don't be too tough. Uh, light, lower the taxes. Do some things. Make it easier because Solomon made it kind of hard. So what happens? Rehoboam says no. He listens to his younger friends and they tell him, raise them, punish them, get all you can from them. So then Jeroboam takes leadership, Jeroboam takes some of them to the north, and eventually the kingdom is split. And then Rehoboam's like, you know what, I'm going to go fight Jeroboam, and we're going to duke it out because he stole half the kingdom. And uh, the, the prophet came to Rehoboam and said, Rehoboam, don't go do that. Don't go do that. So now we have two different kingdoms. Now we pick up our story. What's going to happen? Well, in verse 1 of chapter 12, we find, number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. And no, this is not from a movie, but we find the resistance. The resistance. I know some of your minds went directly to a movie. Stop that. We're in church. Stop it. The resistance we find in verse 1, Rehoboam establishes his kingdom. He strengthened himself. This has been about three years. Go back to chapter 11. Look at chapter 11. In verse 11, the Bible says, And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and store of victual of oil and of wine. So he builds everything he needs. He fortifies his cities. He's prepared for anything that will come. And God is blessing him, blessing his kingdom because he's doing what is right. And after Rehoboam used God for everything he needed, then he refused to put him first. Isn't that with you and I? Things are going well. We don't give God the attention He deserves. We don't give God the time He deserves. We don't pray to Him like we should. We don't read His Word like we should. We don't care about the church like we should. We don't care about others like we should. We kind of set God aside when things are going well. The Bible teaches us that we're to seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? That should be our number one priority and number one goal according to Jesus. In Rehoboam, things are going great! And he sets God to the side. The Bible says this is what he does. He forsook the law of the Lord. He forsook the law of the Lord. So when it talks about strengthening himself, Rehoboam, through all this time, he's had a partial walk with God. It comes to a complete end only after three years into his rule. Friend, those who have a partial walk with God, eventually they're going to start to slide. They're going to start to get away. This is what Rehoboam did. He kind of had this desire, and yet on the other hand, he liked the power, he liked the glory, he liked his position. So what does he do? He forsakes the law of the Lord. Now, did Rehoboam have all 66 books that we have? No, no, no. He didn't have the whole Bible at that time, but he had the law. He had the Pentateuch. He would have known the Pentateuch. As a matter of fact, the kings were commanded to read and know the Pentateuch. They would have known the, fir the first few books of the Bible. They would have known all that. They would have known the law of God. And what happens, he gets a big head and he starts to say, you know what? I don't need that. So he starts to resist. The idea of forsaking the law of God, the word for forsake or forsook literally means to depart from something. So what did he depart from? God's Word. Friend, when you and I get, you know, kind of going on with our life and things are going over okay, you know what sometimes we forsake and we turn away from? God's Word. God's Law. You say, how do we know that? Well, it's not a priority in our home. 
We don't read it. We don't apply it. We don't live it. We don't listen to it. It's not a priority. We're doing the exact same thing Rehoboam did. The only difference is Rehoboam was the leader of a country. You and I lead our homes. We run our homes. And what happens when we forsake God's word, God's law, God's purpose, God's goals, destruction comes. Okay, let's continue here with this, this idea. So he strengthens himself. He gets a big head. He does these things. The Bible says when he had become, uh, when he strengthens himself, it suggests that pride and self-reliance have replaced Rehoboam's dependence on God. Uh, I forget what pastor said uh, years and years ago, but he was preaching, and I had the quote, and I can't remember who, who said it, but it's amazing how much the church could do even without the Holy Spirit. We don't need the Holy Spirit. We don't need Him working in our church. We can just keep going on and on without Him. So called, right? So called. No, we desperately need God. We desperately need Him working in us. We desperately need Him to, to lead our lives. And yet, we can go on with our life and act like God's not even a part of it. That's what Rehoboam has done. And it doesn't stop there. That's the problem. Too many become satisfied in their lives. I'll just be as much of a Christian as I need to be in modern day America. Friend, I'll tell you what, we were starting, we, in our, our Sunday school, we we're doing a study about the miracles of Jesus. We just started with the miracles in the church in Acts, and we see the Holy Spirit came down and indwells believers. I'll tell you what, church, you and I, we don't resemble the early New Testament church like they did. Man, there were some things that we don't have passion about. They were under persecution and that they were fired up for the things of the Lord. That's what they did back then. That's what they did back then. So he forsakes the law of God. Go back to our text here this morning. So he forsakes the law of God. He abandons it. He was justifying his sin. Friend, listen very closely. For three years, he's followed in the footsteps of David. And now he abandons them. Psalms 86, 11 says, teach me thy way, O Lord, right? This is not what Rehoboam was saying. Let me ask you a question, friend. When's the last time you said, God, what is important to you? Because I want to make that important to me. You'll only find what's important to God from his word. But we see number one, we see his resistance to the things of God. Now number two, if you're taking notes, write this down, the response of God. The response of God. Look at verse two. It came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, so now we've had three years where he's sort of lived for God. And now we have two more years where... He's kind of not all that into it. And now God is going to allow something into his life to get his attention back on God. Does everybody see that? Now it's been five years into his reign. And now did God bring judgment right away? No. Listen, listen, just because God hasn't brought judgment in your life in a mighty way doesn't mean, you know, that God's not upset with your lifestyle. Friend, it is vital and it is important that you and I see this as an act of mercy. Hey, just get right. And he did not. Let's continue our story here in verse 2. You still with me? We see the resistance. This is a character study on Rehoboam. And now we see the response of God. So God allows Shishak from Egypt. So if you look on a map, if you're looking at a map, you see Israel here, the northern kingdom. Then you see the southern kingdom, Judah. And just below that is this place called Egypt. A powerhouse at the time. And God is going to use these people to bring judgment on his people. God responds to rebellion. God responds to rebellion. Because Rehoboam felt that he no longer needed God. Listen closely. God allowed Rehoboam to face Pharaoh's army without his protection. If, and I mean if, Rehoboam had been serving God and living for God and been seeking God's presence, did you know even though Egypt was much more powerful than Judah, they wouldn't have been able to take them because God would be protecting them. Right? But when we step out and we abandon God's will, God's way, we don't care about His purpose, God, at times, will remove His hand of protection. That's what happened in our story here. God removed his hand of protection on Judah. 
Now, we're going to see that God is still in control even when he removed his hand. What was he trying to do? He was trying to get his people to wake up. Stop forsaking my word. Stop living however you want. Stop trying to devise a plan for life on your own. Include me in it. I delivered you. I brought you out of bondage. I have brought all these, this, this wealth to you. I've done all this for you. And you turned your back on me. Let me ask you how you would feel. You help someone. You give them a lot. You help them along their way. And then one day they wake up and they want nothing to do with you. Don't raise your hand, but uh, probably many of us in here have had that happen before. You help someone an awful lot and then they kind of turn their back on you, right? You love them. You care about them. You, and then they turn their back. How do you think God felt when he'd done all this for his people? And they said, no more. Notice this response from God. Because they chose to live without God, God temporarily moved his hand of protection. The idea, look at the end of verse 2. They have transgressed against the Lord. The word transgressed literally means they were unfaithful to God. Don't sugarcoat sin, be honest. Sin is transgressing. You're unfaithful to the things of God. Be honest in your life. Don't sugarcoat say, well, I made a mistake. No, you sinned. You transgressed. You went against God's will and against God's way. When we start with that, then we can start looking for ways back to the Lord, getting right with Him. But it has to start with that foundation. So God sends this powerful king. If Judah insisted on forsaking God, they would find themselves forsaken in the day of their need. <laughs> the great danger of telling God, leave me alone, is that someday He may answer our prayer. Friend, you say, Pastor, this is kind of a harsh, harsh story. No, I don't think it is at all. I think it's a wonderful story. I think when we stay faithful and focused on the things of God, we understand that God's protecting us, God's providing for us, God's taking care of us. But when we step away, sometimes God will bring things, things in our life to wake us up so we can get back to Him, so we can once again enjoy the blessed, joy-filled life. And that's what Rehoboam, God was trying to get his attention. Notice number three, the repentance of the people. The repentance of the people. See if this sounds familiar. Right living for a time, and then in your and my life, sometimes we resist the truth, and then we're rebuked, and then we're re we repent, and then we return right back to sin. Does that sound familiar? Man, it does in my life. Sometimes I'm doing the right thing, but you know, I get complacent, and then I start resisting truth, and I know I should be doing certain things, but I don't. And then the Bible or a preacher, I, I get rebuked from God's Word, and then I repent, and then what do I do? I return right back to it. You see this pattern that happens in many lives? It ought not be the case. Look at the repentance of the people. Pick up in verse 5 if you would. You still with me? Don't, don't lose me. We're, we're, please stay with me. Verse 5. Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem. So what's happened? This enemy, Egypt, is coming. He's on his way. Rehoboam is gathered with all of his leadership. They're trying to figure out how are we going to stop the enemy? Because this enemy comes in. He starts to take all the cities that are in southern Judah. He starts to take them one after another, after another, after another, till eventually he would get to Jerusalem. And they all knew what would happen if he got to Jerusalem. So they're devising a plan. What do we do? Do we pay somebody else to come and protect us? Do we do all these other things? But God sends a prophet. In those days, that's how God did it. God would send a prophet to tell them what, what they should do. Look at verse 5. So what does God do? God in his mercy sends somebody and he tells them this. He said unto them at the end of verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. You've forsaken me? I put you in the hand of the enemy. Because I want you to see, I was the one who's protecting you the whole time. I was the one who was taking care of you the whole time, and yet you didn't acknowledge me. Christian, you and I, we ought to spend most of our days acknowledging God, that He is in control, that He is taking care of me. That's what we should be doing, not focused and complaining and whining about everything going on in life. We ought to be focused on Him. Oh, what a difference of a life that would make, wouldn't it? 
They weren't doing that. So what does God do? God allows them. So notice not only the resistance to God, the response of God, now the repentance of the people. So once they're confronted, look at verse 6, whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said what? The Lord is righteous. In other words, what are they saying? God was right all along. You see, when you and I go to repent, this is what we're truly saying. God was right all along. I was wrong. I was the one who stepped out of line. Does everybody see that? When you repent, it's not about these fancy words you use. It's about saying that I was wrong. God was right. And I'm going to start putting him first again. Does everybody see what they've done now? The Lord is righteous. So now they repent. The Lord is righteous. The Lord tells us how to have a relationship, how to treat our spouse, how to handle finances, how to treat other people, how to do all these things. The Lord is right. I am wrong. Right? Okay, some people think that's right. God is right. The Lord is righteous. He is holy. He is in charge. He is in control. So this is what they accept. They repent. Any punishment, this is what they're saying, God, any punishment you give us, it's acceptable. Because I know you're doing it to get me back on track. Any, anything you bring my way, God, I'm okay with. Can you say today that God is righteous? Or in your eyes, would you say today in your heart, God's made some mistakes. God's messed up. Friend, I know we don't, don't like to say that out loud, but sometimes that's how we live. God's not first. Friend, you need to stop for a minute today and say, God was right all along, and I was wrong. That's true submission, and that's true humility to Almighty God. What does God value so highly? Humility among His people. No pride, no arrogance, no thinking we're the ones that are right. God is always right. So now we have this enemy that's coming. Now we have people, they've forsaken God. But I love this about God. When we come back to him, he's like, here, come here. I'll take care of you. Come here, I'll protect you again. Come here. I love that God is so, God is so much better at forgiving than I am. God is so merciful. You know, when you stray and go away... And God says, you know what, just come back. Repent, come back to me. I love you. I'll take care of you. I'll help you. Do you come back? I'll show you the better way. God was right there for them. Look at this path of restoration. We're going to look at just a couple more verses in our, in our closing remarks here. So look at verse 8. So when he repents, is this genuine? Let me be honest with you, folks. Just, just being very clear. There's some people who come when they're at their lowest point. Just being very clear and very honest. Some people come when they're at their lowest point. They either try church. Maybe it's the last thing they know to try. Or maybe they'll try religion or whatever it may be. They'll try these things. And they know they're confronted with what they're doing is wrong. And then what they say is, I'm going to change. And then the question is, is it genuine or just for a time? So let's see what it was with Rehoboam. Was this a genuine turning back to God, a revival that's going to take place? Or was this just a, I'm scared, I have no way out, I'm just going to try God again? Let's see. Look at verse 8. You still with me in this story? Once again, we're doing a character study in this story. Look at verse 8. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the what? Whoa. So what happens? God still allows Egypt to get to Jerusalem, walk through the gates of Jerusalem, and come to the temple and loot the temple. Just because you repent and turn back to God doesn't mean there won't be consequences. Right? So God allows them to come in and they can plunder the city. Oh, that had to be embarrassing. As a leader, you were the one responsible to protect your people. And yet, Shishak and his men could just march right into your city and take what they want. Oh, man, what a hard pill to swallow. By the way, friend, I don't want to sugarcoat this at all. Sin is devastating. Sin hurts. Sin causes problems. Man, it just breaks my heart to hear the story after story of what people have done and what has come as a result of it. Sin causes trouble. 
man, it hurts and it's devastating. And you can just imagine as the Egyptians walked in and took everything they wanted from the precious temple where they worshipped Almighty God. Do you think that made some people mad? Oh, certainly I do. So what happens here is this path of restoration is now turned back. But look at what happens, okay? Look at the end of verse 8. He took all, he carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. I don't have time to go into all of this and why I believe it comes to this number. But from everything I've read, we're talking somewhere around $53 million worth of gold that was taken. $53 million was taken from Jerusalem. It was used to worship Almighty God in the temple. It was taken. Sin hurts. Sin hurts. So now the question is, would revival ever happen under Rehoboam? Let's look at these last uh, couple verses here. Uh, look at verse 10. So they've taken the shields of gold. Those would be right outside the temple. And look at what happens. Instead of which, King Rehoboam made shields of what? Okay, brass isn't gold. Brass isn't worth what gold is. But brass is a replacement. You know what I believe was happening here? You know why I don't believe revival would ever happen under Rehoboam? Because number one, he was more interested in appearance than observing the law of God. So what Rehoboam does immediately after they leave, he replaces the look of the temple. He replaces it with something that's not nearly as valuable. Why? Because he still wants everybody to think he has it all together. He still wants everybody to think that he's not in the wrong, everything's okay, we'll just bring these shields out, we'll put them in front of the temple. Every time Rehoboam comes to the temple, we'll put these brass shields. They may look similar, but they're not the same. I think Rehoboam was more interested in his appearance with other people than observing the law of God. Friends, you be careful. Don't be so consumed about what others think about you. Number one priority, what does God say about it? I don't want to get into politics at all this morning, but it doesn't matter to me what somebody says. It matters what God says. Does that make sense? Now tonight in Romans 13, that's where we're at. We're going to talk about what part the government plays and what part as a Christian I have toward the government. God puts all that together. We'll cover that tonight. But uh, the thing that I should be most concerned about is what does God say? And to be honest with you, I don't think Rehoboam really cared. There would be no revival in Israel because Rehoboam only cared about what others thought about him, not about what God thought about him. These were temporary coverings he would bring out. He, he, his sin has made him poor. But just like one pastor said, many God-fearing people are poor, yet still filled with the joy of the Spirit. It's not about if you have money or don't have money, if you're right with God. The fact is, there is a joy inside because of what Christ has done. Now, Rehoboam has neither. No joy from God and no money. God's taken it all. And yet, he could still turn around, but he chose not to. Um, go to uh, verse, verse 13, very quickly. Verse 13 of this chapter. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign. He reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem. The city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nama and Ammonitus. From what we understand about Rehoboam, his mom, who Solomon would marry, because Solomon married all those different women, brought all those different idol worshipers to Israel. His mom, Rehoboam's mom, married to Solomon, would bring in idol worship into Israel. Would corrupt the temple where they should have been worshiping God. You see, Rehoboam didn't want a revival because he was more concerned about what this person said or what this person thought. He didn't really care about the law of God. Number two, we also see he was only interested in turning to God with his life when it was for his benefit. In other words, I'm struggling financially. Let me try God for a little bit and let's see if God can help me out. It's not the way it should be, friend. It ought to be, God, you're first in my life. I want you more than anything else. I don't care where you put me. I don't care where you want me. I just want to be in the center of your will. I just want to be serving you, whether it benefits me or not. 
That's how our attitude should be. That's not Rehoboam. And thirdly, I want you to see this under the reason why revival would never happen. He was more interested in his appearance than observing the law of God. Uh, he, he was only interested in turning to God with his life when it was for his benefit. And number three, his heart remained the same. His heart remained the same. Um, I don't have time to, to go to several more passages tonight. You can read more of this story in, in the book of the Kings, but you can find everything he did. You can find a list of all these things that Rehoboam brought into Israel. Friend, I don't know about you tonight, but, or this morning, but I don't want to be a Rehoboam. I don't. I, want to, I don't want God to have to bring something my way to get my attention. You know, sometimes uh, my wife, I've told this story before, when my wife is trying to get my attention, maybe some of you men can sympathize with me, I don't know. Maybe I'm the only guy who does it. When my wife wants my attention, I'm sitting in my chair watching football or doing something, reading a book, something. My wife will talk to me. And you know, men, if maybe I'm the only one. You do the grunt, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Got it. Yeah. And then my wife knows I'm not fully invested. So this is what my wife will do very kindly. She'll come over and she'll grab my chin and say, Babe, I need your full attention. I need you to listen to what I am saying. And I'll say, okay, okay, I got it now. And if there's a football game on, as long as it's not the Green Bay Packers, we'll, uh, no, 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 wait, I'll always listen to my wife, okay? Don't judge me. And uh, I will turn, I'll look at my wife, and she'll get my full attention and focus. See, this is what God didn't have from Rehoboam. And today, what God needs from you, your full attention. God, I want your will. I want your way. I will, I will make changes. I don't want you to have to bring something into my life to do this. God, I want to serve you. I want to live for you with the rest of my life. That's what God wants from you. The question will be, are you more interested in what other people think than what God thinks? Are you only interested in turning to God when it's for your vet benefit? And has your heart ever been changed? Friend, today there's one or two people in this room. There are those who know God through Jesus Christ. They've accepted His gift. You're His child. If you are His child this morning, you're doing one of two things as His child. You're drawing closer to Him or you're going farther away. There's no middle ground. None. So the question would be, as a follower of Christ, are you actually drawing closer to Him or not? Ask yourself that honestly. The second question would be this. If you're here today, maybe no one's ever showed you from Scripture how to become a child of Almighty God. I didn't ask if you just believed in Jesus. The devil believes in Jesus too. It doesn't mean he's a child of God. Has there been a day or time in your life where you were born again into the family of God by believing you're a sinner? Your sin casts you to hell. You need someone in your place to die for your sin. You believe Jesus did that. And today, you'll call on Him. You'll turn to Him. You'll repent of your sins. And you'll turn to Jesus Christ as your Savior. Friend, there's only one or two people in this room. Those who are His children and those who are not His children. And if you are His children, the question is, are you living like Rehoboam? Forsaking the law of God? Or is this your number one priority in life? You read it in the morning, you read it at night, you think about it, you ponder it, because this is everything. Friend, what would you say in that regard? Where would you be? Where would you be today? Heads bowed, eyes closed this morning. Would you consider these thoughts from God's Word? We saw a very real story. We saw a very real God. Please, friend, don't, don't try to get too, too modernizing of Jesus and God. Don't try to make them be your best buddy and they're all cute and fuzzy. No, God is not only love, God is just, or else God wouldn't be perfect. God is perfectly love and perfectly just. Friend, today, what do you need to do before God? Would you play the organ? We'll play. If you want to do business with God there in your seat, talk to Him today. Is God's law bigger than anything else to you? If you'd like to use an altar, why don't you come for it? Maybe you'd say, I've been distracted from God a little bit. I haven't put Him first. I haven't made him number one. Some will come forward and use an altar. Please don't look around. You do business with God as you need to.